16, when, when was Hurricane Michael? 2018, Pastor John and them get hit with a 200-mile-an-hour hurricane called Michael that went up through Panama City. And though our buildings were flooded, his building was turned into Jiffy Pop popcorn. If you remember that old popcorn, it popped up, literally blew up his building. And uh, so I met him at Pastor Rick's conference in Oklahoma. And when I heard him speak and, and literally asked for, you know, hey, is there anybody that can help us, my baby jumped inside me, and I knew that we had to pay it forward. And uh, not only did we give him a large uh, donation for their church, but uh, we got a crew because it, to me it's not about finances so much as it is about my hands. I want to, you know, deeds to me are important to be able to do something. So we raised a little fi finance. We took a bunch of scooters down to Panama City and an RV, and we, we camped out for a week. We put together a sanctuary, a ceiling for you, and cleaned up outside. My son Judah even went on that trip. Met John and, and just kind of fell in love with it, with what he does there in Panama City and knew that him and Brandy and, and Little Bird going to be here this week. Uh, I said, why don't you just come and share the word of the Lord with us today? And I know some of our people have gone to Panama. Now, when you think Panama City, you think of the luxury side. There's two sides of Panama City. There's the luxury side, which I'll go make luxury. Then there's the blue collar. Uh, Pastor John lives on the blue collar side. Amen. Across, across the bridge. Now, before I got to church today, I talked to Pastor Kenneth Smith. And many of you know that Kenneth and DeRitter was hit with a hurricane through Lake Charles and up into the DeRitter last year. And we brought a crew there and helped uh, reconstruct a home and, and brought supplies and gas and everything else. This is important to me, that the body of Christ pays it forward. Amen. That God blesses us and has blessed us, and we're going to bless others. Can I get an Amen. And sometimes you may not be able to give with your finances, but you can give with your hands. Amen. You can come. I remember Parker came and helped us. My whole goal that day was keeping Parker from sitting down. Amen. Come on, Parker. Let's go to work. And we just keep working. We just work. You just kept right on working there and uh, never forget it. Love that boy. Would you welcome Pastor John Ramsey, Panama City? If I could. Hey. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Thank you so much. It's, you know, it's an honor to be here today, and, and I tell you, there's really no words that I can really put it all in perspective, just what your church and your pastor has done for us. Um, it means the world, and, and I know that you know what it's like to be through a storm and through a disaster, and, you know, when we were looking at all that, you know, it was a, it was a matter of trying to, you know, get our, get our bearings and find out what we were going to do. You know, when you're, when you're, uh, the hurricane happened on Wednesday night. The only thing I'm thinking is where, where can my people meet on Sunday? Because I know God's people need to stay together. Amen? God's, God's people need to stay together. And uh, pa your pastor, uh, Pastor Jerry Hovater, he's, uh, he's uh, number one. Amen? Give him a big hand, everybody. <clears throat> now, let me tell you, I'm thrilled that you have the lights on. Amen? <laughs> That's the first church I've been to in a while besides my church where the lights are on. Amen. Uh, you know, uh, out when, and when you're out in the world, and I know you don't remember this, but when you're out in the world, when they want to clear the bar room, they turn the lights on. They used to call them the ugly lights. They turn the ugly lights on. Everybody, you know, everybody, that's how they empty the room. But, you know, in God's house, we should be pretty enough that we can keep the lights on all the time. And I'm glad to see you this morning. Amen. I'm glad that you're here. And the first thing you're going to notice about me is that I I, I see sound I, I don't know how far west i am do y'all still say y'all or, or do you say ewins okay I, i'm i'm still in the south so y'all still say y'all i say y'all and and i had a radio program for years and i would preach on this radio program and then i would go somewhere in person and people would look at me funny and they would, they would you know just all this and i said what you looking at they said well your voice does not match your body and I don't know if that's a compliment or not, but they say your voice, they say you don't, you sound really Southern when you talk, but you don't look that way. And I said, I'll tell you what that is. My mother is from Gallup, New Mexico. She's full-blooded Mexican. And my father is from Wingo, Kentucky, just as country as he could be. So I look like her and I sound like him. But I said that one time in my church and one of my people ran up and said, Pastor, I know what you are. And I said, what is it? He said, you're Hispanic. Uh, yeah. So being Hispanic like I am, I like bluegrass music. How many like bluegrass music? Now, I don't know you usually try this at churches these days because now at my church, we, 
we do contemporary music. You you could have, as a matter of fact, with this same lineup that you did, you could hear any Sunday morning at, at my church because we do mostly contemporary stuff. But me personally, I like bluegrass music. But you can't play bluegrass music a lot in church because bluegrass empties churches. Amen. I, so, so you can only say little tiny doses of it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing a bluegrass song if that's all right. And this is the only bluegrass album I ever did, and it's, it's about, and I don't have any today to sell. I'm not really in the selling business, but on the front cover, it's my, my dad when he was 10 years old, Wingo, Kentucky. And on the back, it's my mama when she was 10 years old, standing in front of them, one of the big red rocks in, uh, in New Mexico, and he's standing in a tobacco field right there. And uh, they're just simple people, love the Lord. Uh, when we built that sanctuary that just got destroyed, my father was the first person to come down the altar and give his life to the Lord. And it means the world to me that they're still with me. And, uh, you know, I see, a, I, I see a lot of senior people here, and, and there's a great, great blessing in being able to walk with people a long way down the road. Amen. And I thank God for that. And we ought to honor we ought to honor our elders, and we ought to honor the people that God's given us with experience around us. And uh, I wrote every song on this album, and every song is about my family because I believe family is the only government that God really recognizes. Uh, if you look at the Bible, man, everything's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That God meant for one generation to walk with the next generation and teach them how to walk for the Lord, and then that generation teaches the next generation how to walk with the Lord. And if there's no one walking with the Lord, then no one knows the way to go. What did Jesus say to, to Peter and James? He said, lay down your nets and follow me. He said, walk with me. You can't learn this out of a book. You can't learn this at a class or a conference. The only way you can learn it is if you lay down your net and walk with me. If you don't walk with me, you won't get it. And how many know there's some people in here been walking with the Lord a long time? Amen. And so this is a, this is a, a true story, this song. I wrote this song called The Flower. They used it in one of the, how many have ever heard of the Chicken Soup for the Soul books? Yeah, this, this story, The Flower, by John Ramsey, is in the second helping of Chicken Soup for the Soul. And I've got letters from Poland and, and uh, France and, and Georgia, all over the place, that, you know, way, way out there. And, uh, and it's just it's a true story, so I'm going to sing it. If you can do, go, go ahead with it. The, this is called The Flower. Real bluegrass. Yeah, this is Alan Jackson's little play. Boy asked me an unusual question. When I got done preaching one day, he asked about the ropes in there on my jacket. Would I keep it or throw it away? This what I did. I reached and unpinned it from there on my coat. I held it out straight in my hand. What are your plans? And he said, preacher, my mom and daddy, they split up last year. Dad said that I could not stay. Mama, she's married, a man I don't know. And I just seem to be in the way. He said, preacher, my granny, she loves me. Oh, she cooks for me. Always makes me feel so right at home. She even made me a bed next to her so I don't have to wake up alone. Can I give this flower to my granny? I'm not sure that she really knows just what it means to me to know she loves me. And what it means for me to have a home. Well, the little boy's words just stopped me right there in my tracks. And I choked up as I pulled back the ropes. I said, son, there's just no way you can give this to Granny. He said, preacher, how will she know? I said, son, they're from the pulpit. There's a big bouquet of bring them to the church to mark an occasion or 
to make things look pretty, trying to tell God how much he's worth. And I said, son, you take those flowers and you give them to your granny and then you tell her the words you told me. Then don't let a day pass without letting her know she's made a difference in you and now me. Go and give those flowers to your granny. I'm not sure that she really knows just what it means to you to know she loves you and what it means for you to have a home. One more time. Can I give these flowers to my granny? I'm not sure that she really knows Just what it means to me to know she loves me And what it means for me to have a home All right. All right. Praise God. Hey, brother, with the standing ovation, I'm going to give you this CD, okay? Okay. The rest of y'all should have stood up. Amen. <laughs> God bless you, my brother. God bless you. God bless you. Praise God. God's good, isn't he? Give the Lord a big hand of praise this morning. <clears throat> Come on, has he been good to you? Yeah. How many knows if he didn't do anything else, I'm already blessed. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, I grew up around Pentecostal people. I, I remember getting born again when I was just a young man, and uh, we went to the Baptist church. But when I got a little older, it started where I could go around. I began to go to a little assembly of God, and uh, I saw people have the Spirit of God. It seemed more a little lively to me, and I began to go to the Spirit-filled church. And I've been pastoring for 30 years, and I've seen all kinds of people in all kinds of ways. But I've also seen people that were addicted to the shout. They wanted, they wanted the experience of it, but not really the life of it. I want a victorious life, amen? I, I don't want to just feel him in church. I want to feel him at home, amen? I, I want to know him. And so, you know, I spent most of my life teaching about the Spirit, following the Spirit. And I know that it's easy sometimes, almost just by default, that we begin to follow around people. But, you know, and we do what people, people do this, so we do that. This church does that, so we do that. People, and these days, following people can be very dangerous. You know, right now, if you're following people, you ain't even going to church. I'm going to follow the Lord. I, I don't want to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Amen. I want to gather with God's people as much as I can. And I know this year it's been difficult. But we look at people and we want to follow the Spirit. And, and that's what I'm going to talk about in just a moment. But I, 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 you, you want to come up now or you want to take a break? or You just go, go on with it, okay? If you need to stop me, then just throw something at me. And I'll, uh, I'll duck or I won't duck, and then I'll be struck by the Spirit. Amen? I, and uh, praise God. But, you know, I, I think that this is, this is what I want to say, that Jesus didn't spit on everybody. Amen? Now, now let, me, let me get this. So let me start with John chapter 9 and verse 7. Amen? Where Jesus, this is scripture where Jesus uses his spit to heal somebody. But he didn't spit on everybody. I want to read it. John 9 and 1 says, Now Jesus passed by and he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents have sinned but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no man can work. And that's a reference between spirit and flesh, the day and night. For as long as I am in the world, I'm the light of the world. And he said these things. And then the Bible says, he spat on the ground and he made clay with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam which is translated sent, and he went and washed, and he came back seeing. Jesus sped on the ground, and he used his spittle to heal this man, but Jesus didn't spit on everybody, and, and this, is what, this is where we come into with churches. You know, much, much of God's church has conformed to the world, and, and we really don't know it. We've conformed to the world. We didn't realize when, when we made the switch, and the Bible said, to be not conformed, Romans 12 and 2, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove 
what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And, you know, conformity is a slow thing. It doesn't happen all at once. It's not like flipping a switch. You conform things by, by slowly bending them. Matter of fact, the word conform means to slowly bend into shape, a slowly bend in the shape. I remember riding with a pastor friend of mine up in Kentucky, and he pulled up to this big grass field, and he said, you see that right there? What do you think that is? I said, it's a big grass field. He said, that's a part of the West Kentucky Parkway right there. I said, what? He said, yeah. He said, they abandoned this part of the road 40 years ago, and the grass grew up right through the pavement and took it back. I mean, you set it long, long, long enough without any cars on it, the grass will go right up through the concrete because it's a slow, constant pressure in things. And so when you look at conformity, it doesn't happen overnight. And it slowly bend the church. The world is slowly bending the church into what they want the church to be. They're slowly taking things away, slowly making us do this, slowly telling us what's acceptable, what we can do, what we can't do. And, and all of a sudden, if we're not careful, we wind up at the wrong place. And this, this is what I want to do today. I want to reset your destination. I, I want to I change your trajectory is what I'm saying. And, and, and I want to make a little adjustment that today you won't even hardly see. You won't even hardly notice it a little adjustment, and then what, what happens is with this little adjustment, you find that, that you've changed courses. You end up at a different place. Years ago, we were building the church, and they were putting a sidewalk out beside the church, and the man came up to me, the side of the concrete man, and he said, Pastor, he said, we've got a problem, you know, and, and you just love that when you're building something and someone says you got a problem. I said, what is it? He said, your church building is out of square with the highway. And he said, I'm going to put this sidewalk. Do you want me to square it with the highway or you want me to square it with the church? I said, how far is it out? He said, well, a few inches, almost a foot. And I said, well, does it matter? And he said, well, 400 feet, it's going to begin to show. It, he said, it's going to show one way or the other. Uh, you know, and after a while, you know, an inch, if, if I'm building an interstate highway and I'm an inch off, I'm, a, I'm in another county by the time I get uh, 10 miles down the road. You know, I'm a, so, so here's what I'm talking about. Today, we can make a small adjustment, but it'll change your destination down the road. Amen? Uh, in other words, a little bit of truth today, just a little bit of truth today will change where you ended up. And, and at the end of life, when you're saying, you know, my life was different because I made a small adjustment in my faith. I made a small adjustment in what the Lord was showing me to do, and I ended up in a different place. Uh, see, a lot of times we get to the place that we're just, we're just doing what people want us to do but I want to follow the Spirit of the Lord. Amen? I want to follow the Spirit of the Lord. You know, you see, when Jesus sped on this person, he sped on him because that's what the Lord, that's what he was doing. But he didn't want people to begin to copy that. He wanted people to, to find. In other words, we have to listen to the voice of the Lord, not follow what we're seeing, even when what we're seeing is right. What Jesus did when this person was right. But what Jesus did with that person was the move of the Spirit for that moment. Amen? If I could put it like this, you, you, know, you know what I'm talking about. You, you heard the story of, I'm not going to read it this morning for time's sake, but you heard the story of, of Elijah and, and uh, Naaman, when Naaman, the, the man who was a leper. And, and he come to he come to the prophet, and you know he was not he was reluctant to do it. He didn't want to he didn't want to do it. He didn't really believe in church. He didn't really believe in people laying hands on people. You see, I, I like what Jesse Duplantis said. He said, if you don't believe in healing, you're just not sick enough yet. Amen. Uh, uh, you know things have changed. When when you get to place, the doctor said I can't do anything. You'll turn to the Lord. Amen. Uh, so Naaman finally he wouldn't get any better. He finally goes to the prophet. The prophet says, he, it doesn't even come out. You know, preacher doesn't even answer the door, knocks on his door. He sends a servant out and said, you know, Naaman's out there. He said, tell him to go dip in the Jordan seven times. And this, this insulted the man because not only had it taken a lot for him to come to the house anyway, it's, all, it's taken a lot for me to show up at the preacher's house, and then he doesn't even come to the door sends his servant out and tells me to go dip in the Jordan River seven times. And he come there, instead of leaving the house healed, the Bible said he left the house mad. He left the house mad. And, you know, there's sometimes people leave the church mad, not, not because they should have got mad, but because it just wasn't what they expected. How many, how many know I want to start expecting the Lord to have his way? Amen. I don't want a certain thing. I want the thing. Amen. I want the thing for the Lord. So he leaves. But thank God he's got a godless servant around him. Thank God there's somebody 
around you that can get a hold of you and tell you, man, if the word of the Lord is go dip in the Jordan River seven times, man, do that. That's what you've got to do. And so the, the servant tells him, said, why don't you go do what the man of God says to do? So he goes down there. And he dips in the Jordan seven times, and guess what happens? His skin becomes clean. He becomes healed. He becomes whole. How many believe God can still heal you? Amen? Hallelujah. But now here's what I want to catch you on. If you saw Jesus spit on somebody, you're going to try to start spitting on everybody and healing them. And if you was in the bushes watching Naaman, and you saw him dip seven times, man, you know what we'd do in today's church if we saw him dip seven times? Man, we'd take ownership of that thing. We'd change our name to the Seven Dip Church. We'd have Seven Dip T-shirts made. We'd make up Seven Dip songs. And then after we thought we had owned it, we would go out and start beating people over the head and saying, you're not doing it right. You're a six-dipper. You're not right. You're an eight-dipper. You're not doing it. We would start judging people because they're not doing what we're doing because we're the seven-dip church. You know, what we've got to do is I can't do what another church is doing. I can't do what another – he may have told you to dip in the Jordan seven times. He may have told me to take up my bed and walk. He may have told me to go show myself to the priest. He may have told me to go to go wa wash in the pool of Siloam. Whatever the Lord told me, that is the word of the Lord for my life. Amen? So I don't want to follow people. I want to follow the voice of the Spirit. Amen? I don't want to do what people are doing. I want to do what the Lord is telling me to do. And what we've got to do, what we've got to do in this place by this time is you and I have to get to the place that we are hearing the voice of God. We're listening to the voice of God. We're, you know, it's, it's all right to celebrate with people. Man, if someone gets healed, God spits on them, they get healed. I'm going to celebrate with you. I'm going to rejoice with you. I'm going to jump up and down with you, but I'm not necessarily going to do that every Sunday. Amen. If they turn out the lights, I'm not necessarily turning out my lights. Listen, if they all do this, I'm not necessarily doing it. Now, I might do it if the Lord leads me to do it, but I'm not going to do it because you did it. Amen? I'm going to do it because the Lord said for me to do it. Amen? I'm going to do it because God's leading me to do it. Listen, listen, this is the most important thing I could say today. Abraham did not have a denomination. He wasn't Assembly of God. He wasn't Baptist. He wasn't Methodist. He wasn't Crosby. He was, he was nothing. Abraham didn't even have a Bible. He wasn't New King James or Old King James or, or, or International. He, he didn't even have a Abraham didn't have a denomination or a Bible. Abraham heard a voice, and whatever that voice said to do, Abraham did. Even when that voice told him difficult things to do, like sacrifice your son, Abraham said, I'm going to do it because the voice told me to do it. You know, when Moses came to his place where he finally got his life right and he was finally ready, to follow the Lord. How many of you have traveled a long time, but you're ready to follow God now? Amen. How many know God will start speaking to your bushes? He'll start, the bushes will begin to talk to you. And there's a voice that the Bible said that, that Adam walked in the cool of the day with the voice, that Moses stood and heard a voice coming out of the bushes, that Abraham heard a voice and it told him what to do. You and I have that same voice. And if we tune in, to God, he will tell us what to do. It's not a copycat. It's your own voice for your own life, and it leads you to your own victory. Clap your hands if you believe God's going to lead you to victory. <clears throat> but we've got to hear it for ourselves. And this is, this is where we get to the place people don't understand a lot of what, a lot of what they're doing is it's so easy just to follow what people do. And you know what, what I, I don't mean to sound, sound critical when I say this, but if we're not careful, we'll follow God with our flesh. And following God with our flesh looks good, but it doesn't lead to the same place. It doesn't lead to the same place. You know, uh, a lot of people don't understand the difference between spirit and religion. Religion is man-made spirituality. Religion's what we do to show each other. Spirituality is me following God, me and God. And so I don't want to be, quote, religious. And I know, I know you, you say, well, I'm, I'm religious. Well, really, if you're spirit-led, you're more than religious. Religion's not all bad. It's good for me to do some things that are going to help my brother and, and servant-wise and all that kind of stuff. But really, when it comes to the real answer, I've got to hear God. You know, 
it's almost like the modern church is playing the secret game. And you, you remember the secret game when you was a kid. You know, I, I tell uh, I tell Pastor Jerry, I said, Jerry, we, we, you know, or Pastor Jerry tells me, uh, Pastor John, we need, we need to take 10 pews out of the sink. I go off and I, I tell this brother right here, I say, you know, Pastor Jerry just told me we need to take the pews out of the sink. He reaches behind him and he tells the brother behind him, says, something's wrong with the sanctuary. He tells the brother behind him, says, I don't know what's going on, but we're tearing the sanctuary down today. Pastor Jerry shows up, and y'all have got a bulldozer out here, and you've bulldozed the sanctuary. He's going to look at me, and he's going to say, Pastor John, what's wrong with you? Oh, no, he's going to, he, no, you know what he's going to do? He's going to go to the guy on the bulldozer and say, man, what are you doing at my church? And he said, uh, and, and he's going to say, Pastor Jerry told me to tear it down. No, Pastor Jerry didn't tell him to tear it down. He told Pastor John to take out 10 pews. See, the problem with the modern church is we're not hearing the voice of God. We're playing the secret game. We're telling some stuff that God told somebody else, that told somebody else, that told somebody else, that told somebody else. We need to go back to a generation of people that are hearing the voice of God for themselves. How many, how many know what I'm talking about? I need to hear it for myself. I hear for, and that's no reflection on me not following or honoring my pastor. My pastor knows about the Holy Spirit. He knows he can speak to every individual. And so, so it's no reflection on not following your pastor, but at the same, at the same time, he needs you to hear the voice of God. Man, 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 when you come to him and say something like, God told me to leave this church, man, that's on you. You, you better know the Lord told you because he didn't tell him. You better know the Lord told you. And, and so, so we've got to be careful with that God told me statement. Man, that's not a blank check just for us to play with. Amen. We got to get spiritual about this thing. And if we get spiritual, we begin to have things at a different level. And 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna close with this and hand it back to your pastor. But I, I want to say this as I, as I'm closing today. I love you. I, I I believe with all my heart that the Spirit of the Lord put this man in my life. And and I'm gonna say this. I was in a room full of preachers. I, I had we were one month after the storm, and. Pastor Rick Hawkins called me and said, hey, are you coming to the conference? I said, I'm not going to make it. He said, I'm not going to make it. I said, you know, my, my church got destroyed. When I say destroyed, unusable, they, they had to demolish the building. It's gone. It's gone. And he said, he said, oh, he said you're going to make it? I said, I'm not going to make it. We've lost the church. And he said, no. He said, that's why I'm calling you, because I was afraid you was going to decide that. That's why I'm calling you. He said, you're coming to this conference. He said, you get here, I'll take care of everything you need. So I get to the conference. He gathers up all the pastors in a room. I imagine there was 20 or 30 of us. I don't know exactly. And he says, Brother John has lost his church. And just saying that, Pastor Jerry stands up and says, I'm going to give, I'm going to be the first one to give to help the church in Panama City. Now, I've never seen Pastor Jerry in my life. I don't know him from nobody. I don't even know who he is. I, I don't even know who he is. He doesn't, he doesn't know me. We have never walked together. But something on a spiritual level connected, he heard the voice of the Lord and he responded. And miracles began to happen. He, he was the one that took the first step of faith and then it, it began like a snowball and began happening. Now we're still not rebuilt, but we're well on our way. And those first six months had people like y'all's church not helped us, we, we wouldn't have made it. I mean, I went six months, our school was shut down. We have the largest preschool in Panama City. Our church was shut down. We had four buildings. Out of four buildings, three were demolished, totally demolished. They're gone. They don't even exist. We had one building left. We moved the church into that building, and there we have sat for the past two and a half years getting things ready to rebuild our sanctuary and our school. But during those first six months, we were on life support. For the first four Sundays, we had church standing outside uh, the first two weeks with nothing, just standing out in the open field. The second two weeks, they, we had a little tent over us. That was the, We used that first month to try to get the, the little building where we, because it was damaged, even though it wasn't demolished, it was damaged. Get it just, just enough that we could move in and have church. And during those six months, the only thing that kept us alive was churches all over this country where I, I, my people, they were trying to get out of their house. They were trying to cut limbs to get their car out. Their cars were flattened. Their houses were flattened. Houses were gone. 
Sixty percent of homes in Panama City were destroyed. Now I know, I, I know, I, I'm not, I'm not preaching to the choir. I'm preaching to the choir here. You all know what it's like to lose stuff. You've been through disaster with Harvey, but if it wasn't for these churches like your church, we wouldn't have made it. And I came here today more than anything to tell you that your pastor heard the voice of the Lord, and because he did what the Lord said for him to do, he helped save us. And our church exists today because of your church. We love you. Give your pastor a big hand, everybody. Well, I think all it takes is a, is learning to be obedient. But also, for for our sake, man, when, when people came to our aid, it was just in time. I mean. We were wore out, so we knew what that feeling was, and uh, so it was a joy for us to to use that as a ministry opportunity. Go and, and this church supported us. You know, they 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 gave to help out there, and always do. You always do. You always rise up. Um, well, it was good, wasn't it? Did you enjoy the bluegrass? Yeah, my dad's self-taught banjo player passed away a couple years ago, and uh, I was raised on bluegrass, man. And, uh, if you've never snuck into a bluegrass festival, my dad would pay to go in. My brother and I would sneak in through the woods to go in. And we'd hear songs like, She walked through the woods leading down to the river. Her hair shined like gold in the bright morning sun. You ever heard that? Like a fox, like a fox, like a fox. <laughs> yeah, I know a little bluegrass. Yeah, we're going to start as a band, John. Yeah, you better give me a tambourine. Put me behind a monkey in the back. I promise that's the best place for me. If I get our servant leaders to come and help me out here, guys. Listen, uh, you know John's going to have more time in the next service, so if you'd like to come out to Crosby, come on out and follow us out to the, I mean, I'm sorry, out to New Caney, out to the other campus. You're sure welcome to come out. I enjoyed this today. I mean, thoroughly enjoyed this. You know, uh, uh, 20-something years ago, we, we, we started preaching Holy Wild, and uh, knew of no other church had done it. I heard of one other man that said it, but knew of no other church that had done it. You know, it was the mantra. It was the way we lived. It's uh, that God was holy, but he was wild. He called men into the wilderness, and he affected our lives and began to change us and, and never want anybody else to pick that up. Some churches do. That's on, that's on them, but it's hearing the voice of God for your house. And then, then after that, it was, I said, God, what is it that you called us to do? And he said, win, W-I-N, win the loss, integrate the body, and nurture people. And that, that's been our, our mantra. It's been what we've done, you know, winning the loss, integrating, and nurturing. And I watched because, and you know this, there are times, let's just say Pastor John's here singing bluegrass, and next week you want me to sing bluegrass. That's the voice of the Lord for him. Amen. Uh, you know, you, you, so you have to understand that, that God has a different uh he gave you a different personality, the same as all the pastors you meet. Now, this morning, I, I would like for you to give over and above your tithe and offering. I mean, over and above your tithe, and that your offering would help to go toward Pastor John, Amen, and Brandy, and Little Bird. They're going to be around us for a few days. Hopefully, get to have them out at the camp on Tuesday. Uh, we have ropes course at 10:15 on that day. Right after church today, our, our lift Bible study, ladies Bible study, will be meeting. Today is the 18th. Tomorrow's my son's 22nd birthday. It just hit me. Judah Judah is in Colorado right now with Mandy working with her, so we'll pray that all works out good. Also, there's a pool party today right after church, after the second service for the volunteers that came out. We had so many volunteers, so they're going to have a pool party from right after service till 3 o'clock. At 2 o'clock, we got 65 kids coming into camp today. Amen. They'll be there till Tuesday, and I think I got a funeral on Wednesday, and then we got another 150 showing up on Thursday. Amen. What's your week look like? Hallelujah. So because of that, we're, we're asking you to come out if you'd like from the 18th through the 20th. Amen. All week, if you'd like, just call Sister Judy out at the ranch. And uh, for our kitchen crew, our volunteers were great this week. And I, here's what I love doing. I love telling other churches, all them people you see, they just, they just church folk. Amen. They just church. All them grumpy old men out there at the ropes course, those are just church folk right there. Amen. They're not even saved yet. Amen. They working on it. Amen. 
we have a great group that come out. So we will be doing the zip line on uh, Tuesday at 10, 15 this week. Amen. If you'd like to come out and help us. Tuesday night, prayer. Amen. Here in the house, Tuesday night, prayer. Amen. It's a powerful time here at 7 o'clock. Hallelujah. And then uh, the country closet, clothing ministry, August the 1st. So we're going to have our clothing ministry open next week. And the pantry open next week. So if anybody needs to use that, uh, it's uh, able to be a blessing. And by the way, don't be afraid to come and get clothes for somebody else. Don't be afraid to come and get food for somebody else. We have a, uh, both of those open out at the ranch. And so if you need something, please let us know. Also, um, I can't think of it. Why don't you guys go ahead and get you to back the building so folk can give you a, a neck hug on the way out. Amen. Man, that was good singing. It's, it's the fact that, that John could carry a tune, that's good. But the song had meaning. And I found myself tearing up. <laughs> I thought, quit that. <laughs> Don't you do that. Now, look, guys, if you want some church merch, please go online to holywild.net and check it out. You can order your own T-shirt, uh, make it your own size, do what you want. So that's a, an important new part of our, our, uh, our website. Also, you can give on there, holywild.net slash give. A lot of people give it online now, so we thank you for giving online. You're doing, you're doing something I'm learning. I'm still learning. I just ordered my second Amazon thing this week. I've never done that. I ordered an a, a, a ankle brace for my foot, 